Okay, this week I'm delighted to be joined by Lionel Barber, the former editor of the Financial Times, where he served from 2005 to 2020. As editor, he interviewed many of the world's leaders in business and politics, including Barack Obama and Angela Merkel. He's been given several awards for his work in financial journalism, including the Gerald Loeb Lifetime Achievement Award for Excellence in Business Journalism in 2020. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing Lionel's new gripping book, The Powerful and the Damned, Private Diaries in the Turbulent Times, uh, which is here in the salmon pink uh, color of the Financial Times newspaper. Um, so I, I think a good place to begin is, you know, the book starts in 2005 when you, you meet Sir David Bell and he offers you the, the position of um, editor. But we don't really, we don't really get to um, understand the, the line of Barber before 2005. So could you just give us a bit of background? Why did you get into journalism? My father was a journalist and I thought if I do journalism, I'm never going to be as good as he is or was. Um, so I had to think a bit about it. Um, I was at Oxford University. I'd been in Germany. I'd, I'd spoke fluent German. And I, I kind of went for these jobs in business and kept being turned down um, because I got through the first interview and, and then just blanket refusals because they asked questions like, what's marketing? or do you like sales? And I was talking about communication, management, leadership. So I suddenly realized, actually, I'm a storyteller. I like writing. Um, I'd like to be a journalist, and I'll do it my way. And so that's how I got in. And I certainly, it's important to say this, I never planned to be editor. I never dreamed that I'd get to that position. I was quite happy to be a, a foreign correspondent, I worked in Washington for six years, Brussels for six years, and then New York, um, where I was doing a management and writing position. So I was a long time foreign correspondent, um, worked at the FT, but before that worked on the Scotsman, that was my first job, and then the Sunday Times. So I'm not sure if this is a, a bit of an unfair question because you're, you're not an academic and you wouldn't have thought about these things in, in detail necessarily. But let's get into the, the, the title of the book, so The Powerful and the Damned. Um, how do you understand power conceptually? So, you know, Robert Dahl, a famous political scientist, um, his definition of power is A, getting B to do what B wouldn't do otherwise. Um, how do you understand power? Well, I did do political thought at, um, at university, um, and I've read about it. Um, theoretically as well as um, and pra experienced it practically. My understanding as a journalist is uh, the exercise of influence um, to get people to do things that they might do, uh, they might not do, but the person who's exercising the power makes sure that they do it. Um, power, uh, it, I also see it as um, Something which interests me is how much it's through individuals and how much institutions and checks on power. That interests me. So um, I'm trying to think of the Marxist philosopher at Oxford who um, wrote a book called Power, which I did try reading and then gave up after about 20 pages. Stephen somebody, I think it was. Anyway. Stephen Luke's maybe. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, you've obviously spoken to many powerful figures over the over your career: Vladimir Putin, Mohammed bin Salman, Donald Trump. Um, you know, when you get you get to interview them, there's there's something more. You get a, you get a sort of personal insight that we don't get access to through you know reading news and watching press conferences and things like that. Um, did you see a side to these figures that we don't see? So did you see a side to Donald Trump that we didn't see in the press conferences or we didn't see in the inauguration speech, for example? Yeah. So I tried to describe in the book this process where I'm seeing these people close up and personal, stripped of their army of advisors and 
people to protect their image or who, who they are. So that's normally, even reporters, senior reporters, you have to go through a kind of web or a phalanx of people um, who are there to either protect or burnish people's reputations or empower. And my, in my experience, um, if we take Trump, for example, he was more charming in a Tony Soprano way than I would have imagined. Uh, he was also unbelievably narcissistic. I mean, it was extraordinary. I don't think I've ever experienced anything like that. Um, so there was a sort of thuggish charm about him. With Putin, I've met him before twice, um, once at a dinner, which I describe in the book, which was surreal because he, he played the piano afterwards, chopsticks, which was really bizarre. Um, in the Kremlin, on his uh, home territory, I think, by the way, the chopsticks, incident which came after a two hour dinner was in somehow some subtle message that you know one um i am a sensitive person because i like playing the piano but two i'm going to hold you captive and even if my piano playing is absolute crap you're going to have to listen to it so it was playing again on several levels in the kremlin i mean everything was about projecting the power right down to I expected to wait at least five hours. We had to wait five hours to see him. Um, and there is a certain, he has a certain chilling presence. He, he's, I remember, I don't say this in the book, but um, in 2001, um, I was invited to brief President Bush along um, with four other um, prominent individuals. Um, Tim Garton Ash was one. Uh, Felix wrote him um, to brief the president ahead of his inaugural trip to Europe. And I remember Mike McFall, later then the ambassador to Moscow, um, chipping in when Bush said, I'm going to look into his soul. And McFall said, um, well, I'd be careful, Mr. President, because you're not going to see much more than a book of ice. And that's what it is like with Putin. So you're obviously um, the editor who presided over the, the success of the, the newspaper and its online subscriptions. It's now got over a million, I believe. Um, now, you obviously had a lot of talented journalists working with you, Martin Wolf and David Pilling and um, who else? Gideon Ratchman, uh, lots, lots of others. Um, let's run the counterfactual. Um, if you hadn't have pursued this this online direction when you did and you you'd have postponed it in, into the future you just decided you know we're going to continue with the print form for for much longer and we're not going to adapt what do you think the outcome would have been for the paper well i think it would have been finished uh, we we needed a digital strategy there's no question um and remember two things uh, you know first of all as you say i had a team now part of the job of an editor is to pick the best talent and have the strongest people around you. And the people you mentioned, like Gideon, I hired from The Economist. David was long-term, David now the Africa editor, Gideon Foreign Affairs commentator-in-chief. Um, the, the, these are not the people who are managing. My job was to sort of assemble a team who could run departments and follow the general strategic direction. And so it was a team effort. And also, Although I do take credit for saying we've got to raise prices and also telling the board our business model is broken because it was too much based on newspapers and also we weren't charging enough and also we didn't have a, a business model to sell properly digital to, to customers. Um, you know, the fact is the board, I think, understood that we had to go digital. So I wouldn't want to take all the credit. I think I should take a reasonable amount. But, um, you know, this was a joint decision. It was absolutely axiomatic in 2006 that we said we're going to have a subscription model and we're going to charge for content. If we'd not done that, I mean, literally the newspaper revenue, because in the old days, obviously, it was all based on advertising revenue. That was going like that. And we compensated with the subscription revenue going like that. Without that, we'd have collapsed. I mean, you know, we somebody might have bought us or something and then had undue influence, but that's totally counterfactual. And, and throughout the book, 
you describe the role of the journalist as a as a vocation and you know that made me think of I don't know if you've read Max Weber's famous essay politics as a vocation but in that he does talk about journalism um, about the middle section and you know he's got a great deal of admiration for the journalists because their their professions he believes is fundamentally precarious they don't last very long he, he calls them a pariah class because they're, they're often hated by many people um now in terms of precarity and precariousness you you served as editor for 15 years which in the industry is a long time mm. um what do you think was behind that kind of long longevity to your career well i suppose you could say i i was given a chance uh, and i made it clear at the beginning of this conversation that i didn't plan to be ed editor i didn't have a roadmap i always think that's a bit of a mistake in people's careers if everything is all planned out it just doesn't turn out that way so when i was appointed age 50 i had a mandate i knew i had a mandate for change i was experienced i knew i was a pretty good journalist and i was good at motivating people so i thought you know i wasn't i wasn't um intimidated by the challenge i kind of relished it and i thought i'm going to give it my best shot and always in the back of your mind you talked about precariousness the unspoken or spoken bargain essentially is you know if you mess up you're not going to stay as editor well fortunately uh, i didn't mess up i think we did very well on the stories now 15 years it was actually just over or around 14 and a half or so um not or just been over 14 um i i probably would have stepped down just after 10 years or so uh, if there hadn't been a change in ownership because the general understanding unspoken at the ft had been that its editors serve around 10 years so um you know i might have done 11 or 12 but with the japanese takeover they wanted me to stay on and so i had a third chapter and i described that in the book because it was absolutely fascinating getting to understand and and appreciate japanese culture and also helping the transition on on the ft under new ownership which was a delicate and really important exercise and you know i relished that too so you know i was i was lucky i mean you can make mistakes things can come at you out of left field but it didn't happen and by of course you made some mistakes but um people wanted me to be in charge so that was good and then you have to time your exit so you don't you don't screw up before you leave so a big part of the book is obviously the financial crisis of 0708 um and i don't know if you've had a chance to read adam tooze's crash but that's the you know the finest account of how historically significant this was and unprecedented um did you get a sense of that at the time did you realize that we were at a moment of real crisis here and there's going to be a, a lot of turmoil that would follow oh definite without question um this was the biggest story of my career alongside the end of the cold war but obviously with that it was a it was a bit like ice melting if you want uh, to keep the metaphor um it was huge and you know watching those regimes collapse like dominoes in central and eastern europe and then the soviet union just collapsing was an awesome story and i was i did report on part of that mainly from washington um but the global financial crisis the most serious crisis in 2029 i was aware one that it was systemic um and the system the the banking system is literally melting down in front of your eyes and you know other big huge institutions could fail i mean a number did um, starting with lehman brothers or at least actually starting with burr stearns uh, the wall street investment bank so you knew that i think i also gathered mainly because i was always trying to think ahead and martin wolf and i had conversations where it was very clear there was going to be a political aftershock from the crisis what was interesting just on that is initially one thought it was going to be occupy wall street 
um, from the left, and actually it turned out to be more from the right. And, and I think that was probably where I was a bit more surprised. But there's no question that um, I was acutely aware of the historic nature of this financial crisis, that it was global. And above all, and I describe this in the book, it was an enormous opportunity for the FT because we were a global financial news organization. So we could connect dots across the globe and also across um, sectors. And on that, I, I know you're, you've not been editor during the, the COVID crisis, but do you feel a similar sort of historical weight with the current moment in which we're living in? And can you see a, a, a decade of turmoil following? Well, I, it is different. Everything is different. We know about history rhyming and, and uh, or even Marx's comments about history repeating itself. This certainly um, is, a, is an unprecedented public health crisis, which has had an enormous economic shock. Um, I, I don't know whether the political consequences will be quite so profound. I mean, the global financial crisis, we haven't really said this, but I mean, obviously one consequence was populism, um, loosely defined, um, and a crisis of globalization. Um, now there were other things playing into that with the immigration crisis because of the Syrian civil war and the collapse of autocratic regimes, Libya becoming a failed state, triggering migration out of Africa. Uh, you know, there were, there were things playing into that. And then I think um, also a, a real skepticism about globalization, not just freedom of movement, but freedom of capital movement um, playing out. So that, that was very profound. Here with COVID, um, I think I would say, you know, it's not particularly original, but it's turbocharged technological change. Um, it's, it's challenged our way of thinking about the way we're working. Um, I think the state, yes, has become obviously much more important um, through the public health crisis, through the imposition of curbs on our freedoms, um, with these also these massive deficits. Um, but I kind of wonder whether we should also be thinking about the consequences in terms of you know, this era of cheap money. What are, how long is it going to go on? I mean, we haven't really exited these extraordinary monetary policies that were instigated after the financial crisis. So I'm not saying it, the return of inflation is imminent, but, but you can see just certain things happening, certain companies getting into difficulty. Um, green, well, I mean, we can talk about details or examples, but I, I, in a sense, I probably think it's, it's different and may not be so profound as the global financial crisis. I could be wrong. Yeah, I, I think it's difficult to tell. And I mean, again, one thing that has defined this, this crisis is the massive intervention of central banks across the world um, in a similar kind of fashion to 2008. Um, you, one of your regrets in the book is not capturing the, the disenchantment with globalization and Brexit. And well, you, you can't be accountable for, for Trump in America necessarily, but Brexit in this country, certainly. Um, now, it's, it's a book where you've, you're having a lot of experience with, you know, so-called so high politics. Um, you know, Mario Draghi uh, phones you to, to, to ask if he would be a good candidate for the, for the ECB. Um, you know, Tony Blair called me Tony. Um, you know, you, you meet so many interesting and powerful individuals. Um, do you think it's the case that you got so lost in that world of high politics that you you kind of neglected what was going on on the ground. And, you know, if, if so, do you think you would have adapted your reporting in, in a way that kind of was more responsive to that? Well, 
I am critical of kind of slightly losing sight of what was going on in Britain. Um, I, I think that we could have reported in a more imaginative and thorough way ahead of the referendum, in which we would have probably said it, it and, and adjusted um, our readers and indeed ourselves to the prospect of leaving. And we found that just very difficult because we thought that the referendum would be judged on according to rational economic choices. And I don't think it was, um, but we didn't lose the referendum. We obviously campaigned to remain. We're a European news organization and all our commentators were pro-remain. And we tried to get the wider diversity. We did have some signals about where the vote was going. Um, and we didn't fully take on board that. We were sort of a bit seduced by the noise. Now, was that because I was spending all my time on planes going around the world? Um, I think I, there's a grain of truth in saying could have spent a bit more time in my own country, um, you know, going to up north. I mean, I did do quite a lot of traveling in the first seven or eight years in, in Britain, but it wasn't really that. It was about how we covered the country. And so immediately after the referendum, I, I did have a senior meeting and we made some substantial changes to our reporting network in Britain. And I think the coverage reflects uh, better as a result. Um, but there were a lot of people who lost um, sight of what was going on. And in my defense, perhaps, I do remember insisting that we get Nigel Farage to um, speak at one of the FT events. And half the judges on the panel were against on the grounds he was a racist. And I remember saying, and this was 2015, right, 18 months before the, or two years before the referendum, I said, Nigel Farage is the most important politician in Britain right now. And I think I was right. It was just, it, orthodoxy was against me. And, and like I say, you, you obviously had these very personal relationships with powerful figures. So, you know, Draghi would phone you up or Hank Paulson in the, in the US would phone you up to say that, you know, I'm, I'm being appointed treasury secretary next week. Um, how did you how did you navigate that as a journalist? Because you were obviously friends with these people, but you you needed to report in a in an objective way as well. Um, was it difficult to, you know, balance that 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 relationship between being a friend versus being a reporter and being a journalist? Well, first of all, I wasn't friends with Hank Paulson. I think I wasn't really friends with any of them, except maybe Mario Draghi, to a degree, but. Um, it's really important to understand that they weren't phoning up because they thought I had a pretty face or because I was charming and they liked me. They were phoning me up because they wanted to influence and exercise their power and influence over the FT through me as editor. So it was eyes wide open. And I was always very conscious of not being too close to these individuals. And even with Mario, when he'd complain about some coverage, I just tell him politely to get lost. And, you know, with Tony Blair, I mean, we investigated him. We were responsible for him losing his job as head of the quartet. And we, were, we campaigned against him because of, um, for his, when he wanted to be the uh, European Union uh, Council president, because we said, look at all these business interests. He's riddled with conflict, even though he's a talented politician. So, I think to answer your question, I'm very clear, uh, I was always very clear that the access had to be balanced against being captured. And secondly, if I ever came away with stories, uh, anything I wrote would be edited by senior people. And I never would say, oh, excuse me, we've got to write that. So people trusted me that if I was writing, then somebody else would have uh, a second pair of eyes on it. Um, and I wasn't a reporter either. I, I was sometimes a reporter in doing an interview, but my job as editor was to be the, the backstop. 
So when we were invited, I mean, look at what we did with the investigation of Sir Martin Sorrell. I mean, he was furious. I socialized with him. His wife was friends with my wife. But when it came to investigating him because of what he was accused of, um, we did it and we blew it. We blew the story open. So I'm afraid I'm actually quite unsentimental about this. And it, the power relationship is very simple. They want access to me and I wanted access to them. But it's, it, there's no sweet deal. That's a good answer. Um, so when you came to interview these people, um, you know, Trump's obviously very unpredictable and interviews with him are very sensitive because you don't, you obviously don't want him to cut you off. Um, you know, how difficult is it to, to press someone so much without them, you know, cutting the interview or ending the interview? Um, because you obviously well, need a source of information as well. Yeah, I mean, trying to cut Trump off is pretty difficult anyway, because it's just a stream of consciousness. And you also know that you don't have a lot of time. So we had about half an hour. So, it, 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 you know, you have to judge and come to a view pretty quickly about what do you want? Have you got the story? How much time have you got? Now, with Putin, we had an hour and a half. So I had time to sort of play, at, you know, a bit more slowly, win his trust, show a bit of respect that, and people, it's not sucking up. It's just if you're going to attack him from the start, and put him on the spot, you're not going to get anything. Whereas, in fact, we did get a huge story because of what he said about the liberalism being an obsolete idea, and you got the real poisonous Putin in the interview. With, with Trump, you, you, you knew you'd get, probably get a soundbite at some point. We wanted the North Korea, so we're going to ask that. So it is about judging the rhythm. And also, frankly, um, know, knowing enough to be able to throw in a question which hasn't been prepared. I mean, we, I would never su submit questions to people and just have the list. You could submit topics, but I never agreed to just ask questions wrote, right? Never, otherwise I wouldn't do the interview. And President Xi, they, they once said, you can do the interview and just send questions on a fax. And we just said, no, we're not doing that. Wall Street Journal did, we didn't. Um, so I think in an interview, it's important to one, to be incredibly well prepared. And that means not just reading cuts, but talking to people who know the individual. Then second, um, to be able to adjust your schedule. So, you know, improvise. And third, just don't interrupt at the beginning. At least show the ability to listen it is much uh, underestimated uh, as in its importance. It's very important to to listen when you're doing interview. And uh, it's interesting in the book that you, well, you note some of the journalists that are quite prominent today. So Kathy Newman and Sebastian Payne. Um, now you, you saw them when they were young journalists and, you know, budding journalists. Um, what, what makes a good journalist in your view? How could you spot one? Curiosity. That's the most, one of the most important qualities. If people just say, well, we know that, or they don't listen, then they're not gonna be a good journalist, good reporter. Curiosity, being, being willing to go deeper than the press release or the handout or some soundbite, to get the story behind the story, to challenge conventional wisdom, to be curious. That's, the, to me, when people ask me that, I say that's the most important quality. Now then comes the ability to communicate that, the, the answer to the question, to be able to write. And a lot of people mis underestimate how difficult it is to write. I mean, when I write longer pieces, they'll go, you know, maybe five drafts before I hand it in. Um, you, re you really have to work at something if you want to be a good writer. Um, and then I think the third quality I would say is work across medium. So we're doing audio, but doing visual um, uh, is important. You've got to be able to not just print words and also interpret data. Um, I think if you, now it, the multimedia journalist is what's required. It's one of the reasons, by the way, Sebastian was, we were very keen to hire him from The Spectator. We did, because he, he, he could code. Uh, 
Um, apart from, you know, now we've taught him how to be a good reporter, um, or the FT has a little bit. Um, and Kathy was just always unbelievably uh, good digging and wanted to know the story. She, she wouldn't stop until she got the story. Yes, uh, she's still good at that today. Um, so w when you were a, a younger journalist, um, you obviously entered the FT without a economics background. Um, did you think that put you at a disadvantage or did it give you the hunger to learn more? Well, I did think it put me at a somewhat of a disadvantage, but they approached me in 80, late 84 to join the FT after I'd been about a year working as a financial journalist before I'd been sort of business and politics. And I'd written um, a three-part series on the deregulation of the city and the so-called Big Bang. And that had caught the deputy of design. They gave me the job. So I thought, if they, if they think I'm worth hiring, then um, obviously I've got something they want. So I'll, I'll now teach myself. Now, when I went to Washington, I wrote more on national security and foreign policy and covered two elections. And then my next job was to go to Brussels. And it was the, um, at that point, post Maastricht. And, you know, the plan, the march to monetary union. And at that point, I did say to myself, well, I don't have an economics degree. And they, the answer was just, it's fine. Just, you're a journalist, you're a good journalist. Just, you know, you interview the right people, you'll learn. And I did. I'd done a bit of economics just out of interest post-university, trying to understand, you know, some basics, supply and demand, et cetera. So I do think in being a journalist, you don't need to be an expert, but you have to be able to kind of process arguments, process, um, you know, concepts, and then turn them into everyday language. So I, you know, I couldn't do the maths on economics, but if you ask me what the, you know, the mechanics of monetary, and then I could definitely do that. And just on a personal level, what, um, what effect did the role of editor have on you and your health? Did it, obviously it was a, a stressful role, I imagine, but, um, you know, the entire 15 years, did you, did you feel that you coped well? Yeah, I think I did, but I, I looked after myself. I mean, I went to the gym twice a week. I, I cycle regularly, still do that. Um, I used to run into work on the Sundays, six miles. Um, I think physical health is really important to attend to when you're working, you know, 15, 16 hour days. Um, when you're on planes, not, not always drinking on planes is a good thing. You know, if you go all the way to Tokyo, you're going to go straight into a meeting. You don't want to have, um, you know, three quarters of a bottle of wine or something. So there, there's a way of managing your time. I also delegated. So I had a great deputies when I was there. So that meant even though there was a lot of pressure and, it, you know, pressure takes different directions. It could be people ringing up and screaming at you or um, losing someone. Um, as a journalist, they've defected or been hired, poached. That can be stressful, so you mustn't take it personally. And then just having confidence in your colleagues. You're not micromanaging them. And I think that way, yeah, sometimes I got um, tired, pretty tired. I'd fall asleep, half fall asleep in a board meeting a couple of times because of jet lag. But, you know, by and large, I think I did cope. But, I, you know, I have a, was married and married someone I met 35 years ago. She was a great support, big advisor. There are ways, in other words, of managing stress. And so I think, yeah, I think I did cope. And I also was older when I took the job. If I'd done it when I was 40, I don't think I'd have been anywhere near as good. Uh, I'd be interested to um, hear what you think of, um, you know, the relationship between journalism and politics. So. Boris Johnson, Michael Gove, Allegra Stratton, all former journalists, and then went into politics. Um, do you think that reveals something about the British political system or not? Well, it obviously reveals something about 
about modern politics in Britain. Um, and I'm not sure journalists are necessarily um, good politician or may, may, because journalism is in, in many ways is a very short term business. We think about tomorrow's news. We, we operate on much shorter time horizons. As editor, obviously I was thinking strategically about the positioning of the FT and whatever, but it, it, the time frame is different. I remember Bob Zellick mentioned, uh, my great mutual friend, um, uh, making this point about um, someone who'd just been appointed to the American government, who was a former journalist, and just questioning it. And I do question this. I think um, journalists can be, can be, can be glib. Um, you know, they, they package information. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I think Boris Johnson is, is a journalist, but he's a pundit. He was never a serious reporter. I mean, he was too loose with the truth when I was watching him in Brussels. I mean, half the stories he, he, he reported were, 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 were either fantasy or half made up, deeply exaggerated, and very much coming from a certain point of view. Was Delore is crazed um, um, megalomaniac. And Europe is going to be a super state, which was a deep exaggeration, but it captured something in the mood. I think Gove is a slightly different character. He's a more serious individual um, uh, who's got a very good mind. I mean, Johnson has a good mind, but he's clever. Um, he's a bit, he's unscrupulous, both are a bit unscrupulous, frankly. I don't know whether that's a common trait for all journalists, but. In general, I think wordsmiths should stay as wordsmiths. Um, they can have an interest in politics. I mean, I've got an interest in politics. I'm very interested in political figures, but I wouldn't run for office. I've got a couple more, just uh, I'm respectful of your time. Um, now, you've obviously, um, we've talked about the online transition and um, digital media um, in the Financial Times. But you still think that people are always going to, they're going to desire the print form. They're always going to want that pink salmon print form. It's more challenging now. Um, I mean, partly because um, the shops are being closed. Um, the, the whole, what we call the ecosystem of printing distribution, printed newspapers and distribution has been steadily breaking down. Um, but Patterns of reading at the weekend, people I think still have a bit more time to read. So I think there's, and magazines are doing well, if you look at Private Eye, The Spectator. So I don't see the printed form disappearing entirely, um, but I think it is definitely going to. It's, it's just a slow erosion, which is why the digital uh, form is so important. The only thing I would say is that the two, and I say this in the book, they are different reading experiences. The fact is, I think, if you read a newspaper, you take in more. It's a deeper kind of what I call lean back experience, whereas digital is lean forward. It's, it's very buzzy, interactive, get distracted by lots of things. And obviously, you've also got the visual form too, whereas the newspaper, it's less, it's visual is important, but it's not something that you go deep into because you're looking at photographs. The words are just much more important. So it's different. And the last question I've got is, um, again, about COVID. We spoke a bit about this before. But um, in the wake of the financial crisis, uh, the FT ran uh, an inclusive capitalism um, project, and you headed that. Um, do you think COVID has revealed anything about capitalism necessarily? And you know, what does that term inclusive capitalism mean at the moment? Well, clearly, COVID has adversely and disproportionately affected people on lower incomes. I mean, it's increased inequality. It hasn't um, bridged it. And this is with both within countries, but also regions of the world. And, you know, who's got vaccinated and who hasn't? And I think that's potentially very significant. I, 
One of the most important statements in the past week or so is by Dr. Jeremy Farrer at Welcome saying, warning that, you know, we need to do something about um, the two-tier vaccination pop, um, outcomes. So, because if we don't, there could be a reaction. So I think that accounted by for the Franco-German British initiative saying we need a sort of global policy on the pandemic. So that's the first point, it's increased inequality. Uh, I think we've also become much more aware of um, certain jobs, which are absolutely critical, but very low pay. So um, nurses in hospitals, for example, who've been put through terrific um, pressure um, and at great risk, attended dozens and hundreds of patients. So we've got to think a bit about that, about pay. And, and the third is that the, you know, we, we could talk a bit about this, but the extraordinary monetary policies which were pursued um, to rescue the financial system after 2008 have definitely had adverse and perver perverse consequences. They've increased asset inflation, which frankly doesn't help nurses at all. It helps big people who've got positions, hedge funds, um, family offices, all these um, people are also already very rich have become even richer in the stock market. Now you could say, oh, it's capitalism, but it's capitalism which has been um, supercharged by extraordinary monetary policy, the central banks. And then you've had another central bank operation, which is even more extensive um, conducted um, after COVID. So I worry a bit, of, uh, quite a lot about that and the amount of debt in the system. Um, now, what should the capitalists do? Well, one, they could show a bit more restraint about pay. Um, secondly, what we mean by inclusive, and, and I want to be clear, and I said this, I'll back this campaign because it came out of the business side, it did not come out of the editorial side. So I, I, I headed it in the sense of writing a letter, but I took it as one, I'll back this only if it, we're clear about wealth creation being absolutely preconditioned everything we do. I mean, wealth creation is crucial for employment, making the system work. So we cannot question the profit motive. And the second is to adapting Macaulay, um, uh, just making clear that um, you have to reform in order to preserve. So we're making some changes. We think that shareholder value is not everything. It's not the total governing overriding principle. There should be some others. So look after your workers look after the environment, you know, the, these are other factors in the overall um, sort of benchmarks for companies to follow. And if they do that, then it works. So capitalism needs to adjust a bit in order to preserve its position as the preeminent um, business model or economic model. Okay, I think that's all we've got time for. Um... Lionel Barber, it's been a huge pleasure. Thanks very much for coming on. Well, good luck, Ryan. And I've enjoyed talking with you. And whether you go journalism, academia, just keep in touch. It's been a pleasure to talk.